Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my speech on the next generation of safer cross-chain bridges and how old bridges still suck. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I'm a Web3 researcher and consultant specializing in L2s, ZK, privacy, and DAOs. Today, we'll be talking about the current uh, generation of cross-chain bridges, next generation cross-chain bridges, how are L2s better than cross-chain bridges, as well as some steps we can take to improve old bridges. So why this talk? Um, honestly, I'm not a fan of bridges. I'm from the ETH ecosystem, so I kind of prefer staying in my base. But I honestly believe that we will live in a world with many different chains. This is because of scalability issues that every single blockchain has, as well as um, every application has different uh, requirements for security. Uh, if we do live in this world with many chains, we really need better bridge designs than we currently have. And just to give an idea of this, um, in 2022, 69% uh, of all of the funds that were hacked were from bridges. Uh, that resulted in losses over $2 billion. Examples of this are the Axie Infinity Bridge, the Nomad Bridge, and the Wormhole Bridge, which were all hacked. And here's sort of our current categories of bridges. You don't really need to pay too much attention to all the details on this page yet. The idea is there's a spectrum of trust that you get in bridges from trust a human to trust a code. And each of those different categories breaks down into two different types, wrapped asset bridges and liquidity provider bridges. And again, both of those have their, different, their own spectrum of trust in them. So here's sort of our current generation of cross-chain bridge designs. We have three different types. We have custodial bridges, where there's one entity that is in charge of all the bridge transaction, in charge of custoding, uh, custoding the, uh, the actual assets. Then we have multi-sig bridges, where there's a set of trusted actors who are essentially acting the same role as the custodian, except there's many people. Then we have optimistic fraud-proof bridges. Uh, this is similar to um, an optimistic chain. Essentially, all of the bridge transactions are considered valid until someone spots some fraud and then they can contest that transaction. And there's usually a delay period of about 30 minutes in which watchers can do this. And so here's kind of where we're at. Uh, custodial, multisig, and optimistic bridges, they all bridge assets. Cool. Uh, uh, and optimistic bridges, they also can lie about state, essentially. The math behind an optimistic bridge will always tell the truth, assuming they can actually submit the contesting transaction. But there's all these other issues that we have in our current cross-chain bridges. So how do we fix some of these issues, right? Well, like clients and ZK bridges to the rescue. And I'm calling these sort of the next generation of cross-chain bridges. And like clients kind of break it down into two different categories native like client bridges, and then the newer uh, ZK bridges. And just to get you guys excited on like clients, uh, Satoshi actually had an entire section in the Bitcoin white paper on like clients. He didn't talk specifically about bridges, but it tells you a little bit about the power of like clients in a blockchain. So what is a like client? Essentially, like clients help users interact with a blockchain in a decentralized and secure way without having to sync the entire blockchain state. That's compared to a normal blockchain, where essentially you need to download the entire history, re-execute every single transaction just to know the current state today. With a light client, you essentially just download the latest checkpoint, the block headers, and that tells you what are the current account balances or the current storage and smart contract. So how does this apply to bridges? Well, block headers are substantially smaller than the entire state of a blockchain, right? And in bridges, we just really need to know the current state, people's account balances or smart, smart contract storage. So essentially, like clients allow us to store uh, the current state of each blockchain onto another blockchain. So we can essentially interact uh, directly with a blockchain state on a different blockchain through a smart contract um, and uh, directly, you know? So the first type is native light client bridges. There are some protocols that support light clients today, like Cosmos or Polkadot. And these chains already allow you to do, essentially, trust-minimized bridging between their own ecosystem, right? 
but you still need to trust the consensus of the two chains. If either one of those chains gets attacked or is reorged, the bridge lost all the funds. And a note about native light client bridges is the chain has to support it natively. For example, Solana's design can never really support light clients. Ethereum in the future will have light clients with some changes like Burkle trees and some other changes. Then there's this concept of ZK light client bridges or ZK bridges or proof of consensus really. And the idea is this is chain agnostic. We can take the state of any blockchain, make a proof of it, and then submit it onto any other blockchain for bridging purposes. And this is substantially better than current bridges. You still need to trust the consensus of the two chains. Again, if there's a reorg or chain attack, that's going to be an issue, right? Examples of this are ZK IBC and the Gnosis succinct, to uh, succinct ZK bridge to Ethereum. Both of those are being worked on right now. So the sort of benefits of light client bridges are, unlike custodian or multisig or optimistic bridges, you can't lie about the current state, right? And optimistic, you also can lie, but that assumes that they're able to submit a contesting transaction. And sometimes maybe gas spikes and they can't afford to contest it or it doesn't make financial sense. Um, another great part of ZK Light Climb Bridges is that any user can force their own transaction. So let's say the relayer stops working or starts censoring. Any person can withdraw their own funds by making a proof of the chain. And so here's where we're at. We don't kind of have to trust the relayers anymore. There is some asterisks there depending on the design of it. But we solved one of the other issues in this list of issues with bridges. So how are L2s better than any cross-chain bridge? I'm kind of calling these the next next generation bridges. <laughs> Get it? Because there's two layers. Next, next. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's three different types of multi-chain bridges. Note, multi-chain, not cross-chain. There's locally verified third-party L2 bridges, there's native L2 bridges, and then there's fractal ZK L3 bridges. And there's an important note on the third-party L2 bridges. Uh, most of them currently are actually custodian or multi-sig or optimistic. So most third-party L2 bridges don't fit into this category. The only one that I can actually really find is Hop, Hop Exchange, and they, they essentially have as a fallback a trustless force exit that's locally verified. Then there's some newer bridges like uh, storage proof based bridges, which we'll come back to, that are working on bridge designs and that'll be better. And some of you might ask, wait, L2s are bridges? Yeah, they actually are. But there's some important differences between L2 bridges and cross-chain bridges. So here's some examples of how multi-chain roll bridges are better than any cross-chain bridge. So this is arguably the biggest problem for any cross-chain bridge, which is if the chain reorgs or is attacked, you lose all your funds in the bridge, right? If 51% attack, if you 51% attack a POW chain, it's over. The bridge lost everything just from that one moment of attack. And so if either chain in a bridge reorgs or is attacked maliciously, either to wipe out bridge funds or for whatever reason they're attacking the chain, any wrapped asset bridge, all of the wrapped assets become completely worthless and unbacked. And everyone loses their money, wrecks major havoc on the entire DeFi ecosystem. For any liquidity-based uh, bridge, the LPs lose money uh, for any transaction that's currently happening in the bridge. Oh, an important note on this is because of the weakest link property of bridges. Let's say you have a bridge with 10 chains connected. If one of them gets reorged, all of the other chains might lose their backing too. That's really bad. So compared to cross-chain, what happens if uh, L1 reorgs or is attacked? Well, if L1 reorgs, so do the L2s, right? This is the same security guarantee that we have in any probabilistic blockchain like um, Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? And just as an example of this, let's say you're swapping ETH to USDC on L2. If there isn't a reorg, you get your USDC. If there is a reorg, you get your ETH back, right? This is, again, same guarantee that we have in any blockchain. Um, so how about if a, a L2 reorgs or is attacked, but the L1 is not? Well, it's, it's not as ideal as a L1 reorg. 
But essentially, all L2 users and all of their funds, completely fine, completely safe. Um, any native uh, L1 to L2 bridges are fine. They don't lose money. Again, these are the same assumptions as any probabilistic blockchain like Ethereum or Bitcoin. But third-party bridges get a bit more uh, complex than that, right? Um, and any third-party bridge that wait for L1 finality of the L2 states is theoretically fine. That being said, there is no bridge that does this because that adds latent latency to the bridging transaction, right? So hopefully we'll have those in the future and you'll have to wait some hours, but we don't. Uh, any bridge that uses proof of storage, which we'll come back to. The funds are probably fine, depends a bit on design. Uh, any third-party bridge that doesn't wait for the L1 finality of L2 states or use proof of storage, essentially we're back in the same paradigm as cross-chain bridge. The LPs lose money or the wrapped assets become unbacked. And one of the cool features of uh, L2 chain or L2 bridge is you can trigger L1 or L2 trustlessly from the other one, right? So this allows us to do trustless multi-chain messaging. The, essentially, the idea is the L2 contract is already on L1. And for any nodes that validate the L2, they have to run an L1 and an L2 node. And this allows us to interact, for example, uh, L2 can send a direct message through its bridge to any contract on L1, right? This allows us trustless L1 to L2 messaging as well as token bridging, uh, assuming that, that L2 is designed in a way that can't be censored, which they, most of them are. Um, and it allows us trust minimize L2 to L2 messaging and token bridging. And this depends a bit on the bridge design. Again, if you message directly through L1, it's fine. If you use storage proofs, it's probably fine. Or if the relayers wait for L1 finality of L2 states, it's mostly trustless, right? Uh, another cool thing about L2 is we can read L1 state on L2, or we can read L2 state on L1. And this is actually the same ZK-like client that we were talking about. But in multi-chain, we call it storage proofs. So it's the ZK bridge for multi-chain. And ZK-like clients are uh, substantially better on a layer two because uh, you can essentially send the state directly trustlessly through the L1. And this allows us, for example, to inf prove information about L1 state on, for example, StarkNet L2, right? These examples of this is, let's say you lock your funds on L1. You can take a loan on L2 without ever bridging those tokens to L2 because you can read the state of L1 on L2. Or for Snapshot X, you can essentially do voting based on your L1 assets trustlessly on any L2 without having to pay L1 gas, right? Um, then there is this concept of ZK L3 bridges. Again, I'm calling this the next, next, next gen of bridges. Three next, layer three, yeah. Um, <laughs> the idea is for these recursive ZK or fractal hyper, hyper bridges, you can bridge between L2 to L3 to L4 to L5 much safer than any cross-chain or even multi-chain bridge, right? Essentially, all of the different fractals, the L3s, the L4s, L5s, use exactly the same bridge circuit as the L2. So as long as the L2 bridge doesn't have issues, all of those other layers get essentially trustless bridging with no problems, substantially better than any bridge, right? In fact, it's not really even bridging, it's more of accounting, right? Because everyone locks their assets on L2, and then you essentially have a synthetic representation on L3, L4. So you can just kind of teleport your funds from L5 to a different L7 without going through the branches. There is an honorable mention here as well, besides the fractal ZK L3 bridges. Uh, Optimism has been talking about Superchain for a while, but they just announced Coinbase L2, right? Um, and there isn't much details on this. But the idea is essentially you can have one bridge contract on layer one, and all of the different L2s built on OP stack would use the same bridge contract. And that essentially allows you to, again, teleport assets, natively bridge assets from, for example, Optimism L2 to Coinbase L2. There is a seven day delay right now on that because of optimistic uh, fraud proof design, but they are planning on moving to ZK in the future, Optimism and Arbitrum. So then it'll be anywhere from seconds to 30 minutes do the same. 
And uh, again, there isn't much details on this, but this is worth a, a mention because a single bridge contract and then a concept called shared sequencers uh, could really solve bridging and security issues when going from L2 to L2 that is built on the same stack. So here's where we're at with our layer two multi-chain bridges. Uh, L2 third-party bridges uh, kind of fix reorgs and chain attacks. That's huge, right? That's truly one of the biggest problems of any bridge. So it looks like it's only one dot, but it's actually a big change. Uh, native L2 rollups also solve weakest link problem because there aren't wrapped assets or LP loss in native bridging, right? Um, and there's no fragmented liquidity or cross-chain MEV possibilities, again, on the native bridge. There might be fragmented liquidity on layers, but that's a different thing than the bridging, right? Then with a, a recursive ZKL3 rollups, we essentially get trustless L3, L4, L5, L6 bridges that essentially beat, by a long shot, all of these other bridges. And you might notice we, we haven't ticked these last two rows, right? Bridge upgrades, smart contract bugs, prover or verifier bugs, right? So how can we improve these? And here's some steps we can take to improve essentially all bridges to minimize trust in a project. So the first thing we should do is every single bridge, including L2 or cross-chain, should have circuit breakers. So if over 10% of the uh, bridge's assets are bridged out in one day, the bridge just freezes for that day. And this allows the team and the project to take some time. If there's a bug or a hack, they can essentially fix the bug um, before all the assets are drained. Then there is, we should add for any bridge upgrades, we should add delay periods. Because the problem is maybe you've been using a bridge for years and you love it. Then they upgrade it, there's a security bug, and everyone loses all their money. That's what happened with Nomad Bridge, right? And this is a problem because every bridge currently, including L2 bridges, including cross-chain bridges, even if they're not multi-sigs, they use multi-sigs to upgrade the bridges, right? Doesn't matter what category of bridge it is, right? So we should put a delay period on upgrades to let users and LPs exit if they find an issue. For proof-based bridges, um, instead of just having one type of proof, for example, ZK, which I, I specialize in ZK, it's essentially PhD level black box magic math, right? If that breaks, you could lose all the funds, right? So the idea is you can actually use multiple uh, prover systems. So you could have ZK and Intel SGX verifying the bridge transactions and a traditional multi-sig committee, for example, for freezing the bridge, right? And if two of three of them say that there's something wrong with the bridge and one of them broke, you can freeze the bridge, no one loses any money. And Vitalik calls this concept multi-prover plus governance uh, tiebreak. And then Togrul uh, from Scroll came up with this concept of multi-verifier. So separate from the proofs, the proofs are verified on L1 via smart contract. Maybe that verifier has some issues or bugs. So you could essentially implement that verifier in two different languages, for example, Solidity and Viper. And then hopefully if one of them has an issue, the other one can freeze the bridge or stop the transactions. Um, any roll-up and proof-based bridge should allow users to force transactions. So again, if you get censored or something's wrong, the user can force their own transaction through, so you minimize the trust. Uh, for any centralized assets, like for example, USDC, Circle is already the only authority that can mint and burn USDC across chains, right? So we don't need to have wrapped versions of USDC, there's native versions. So Circle actually has this centralized bridge called cross-chain transfer protocol. And that allows you essentially to quote unquote trustlessly um, bridge assets between chains as long as you trust Circle in their nodes. Again, it only works with centralized assets though. So here's where we're kind of at. We kind of fix bridge upgrades and smart contract bugs and proven verifier bugs. But honestly, not really. I'm being a little disingenuous if, we, if I say that. Um, we fix those. I'm a programmer. There's always, always bugs in code, right? The only thing that tested is time x money. How much money is there and how long has it been around? 
So we're never really going to fix those. Time is the only thing that helps, but we still won't fix those. The point of this speech is all bridges suck. Just kidding. Okay, well, they do kind of suck. But there, there's always going to be essentially additional trust assumptions, especially in cross-chain bridging. Um, and it's going to be a long time before we fix these and really get trust-minimized bridges. Uh, for right now, you should keep most of your assets on one chain in native assets. But there are steps that we can take to improve bridging. Please practice safe bridging. Uh, you can also watch the full version of this speech where I go much more into detail on all the different attack vectors, as well as um, some of the other benefits of L2s and Optimistic's new system. I haven't put it online yet. Uh, follow me at ZK Lumi on Twitter, and I'll get it online in the next week or two. Uh, we talked about ZK, Fractal ZK today. Um, if you want to find out in a sort of mathless explanation of what ZK is, how it works, why you should be super excited, I have uh, ZK 101, uh, zero knowledge proofs, and why should you care? Also, we talked about L2, uh, L2s today. L2s have some additional security assumptions outside of the bridge that we didn't really have time to go into, or really some of it is applicable to bridges, some of it isn't. Uh, I moderated a panel at ETH Gathering called um, L2 Security with L2 Beats, Scroll, Polygon, ZK, EVM, and Chain Security. So you can watch that if you want to learn more about issues with L2s. And then finally, check out L2 Bridges, or sorry, L2 Beats Bridge Risk Analysis. It'll give you a much better idea of the risks that you're incurring while using uh, a specific bridge that includes cross-chain bridges or layer two bridges. And you can follow me on Twitter at ZKLumi. Thanks for all your um, time. Cheers.